thrilled uh, tonight to let you know that we're joined uh, tonight by um, you know, the A team. We have three of the commissioners on the on the commission, uh, and I'm uh, I'd like to introduce them to you now. Uh, Dr. David Falkenlay is the chair of the uh, commission. Um, he is um, uh, he earned his doctorate from Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's currently on the faculty uh, there as well as uh, adjunct faculty of the University of Florida. Uh, Center for Arts and Medicine. Um, Charles Chavis Jr., Dr. Chavis, is the vice chair of the commission. He is um, an assistant professor of conflict resolution and history at George Mason University, where he founded um, the uh, John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, Justice, and Race um, at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. And I believe we have several of his students joining us tonight. Um, Ch Dr. Chavis is also the author of the soon to be released published soon to be published um, book on uh, called the, the Silent Shore, which is about the lynching of Matthew Williams and the politics of racism in the free state. It's spectacular. I would, had a chance to read it already and um, you're going to want to know about it. And then uh, we're also joined by Carl Snowden, who is legendary uh, civil rights community activist uh, from Annapolis. He was a a columnist. He also is the convener of the um, Caucus of African American Leaders. Uh, he was actually instrumental in gaining a posthumous pardon for uh, from Governor Glenn Denning years ago for John Snowden, um, no relation, who was uh, executed in Annapolis in 1919. Mr. Snowden also spearheaded the drive to create the first memorial uh, to lynching victims in the state of Maryland, which is um, in Annapolis in 2001. So um, with that in mind, I really wanted to start, um, and you know, uh, David, we, I remember when we were on a um, um, panel at one point um, earlier, before COVID, right before COVID, mm -hmm. um, we had, um, we talked about uh, this film and um, we, um, one thing that came up that I thought was very um, disturbing to me was this recreation that they did in the film. And I wondered if, um, I'd, I'd like to know from you, you know, how, if you think that is appropriate for people to see, even people, well, there's two questions. Is it appropriate for people to see on film? And then the other is, is it, a pe is it appropriate for people to bring their children to, things like that? So I just wanted to ask um, you about that. Oh, well, first off, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Will, for inviting me to be a part of this. So I, I have to acknowledge my context. I was exposed to the horrors of racial terror lynching as a teenager uh, due to my association with the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore. So if you've ever been, they have a lynching exhibit. So you can imagine being introduced to that horror at a, at a young age. And I'm talking about a teenager, not even a kid. It It's a... You always have to be mindful of, of what that experience can imprint on a person, especially if they are, uh, are not in any way familiar with this aspect of history, and, and understandably so. This is not the part of history that uh, they wanted to teach us, that they wanted us to, to be aware of because of just how brutal and how inhumane the act of a, of a lynching is, especially a racial terror lynching. But I, at the same time, to truly understand, I think to, to help codify just how damaging and detrimental and toxic the system of racism is, it helps to put an image to it. And, and I can't think of an image more imprinting <laughs> on someone's mind and their heart and their soul than that of a racial terror lynching. To see human beings do that to other human beings because they don't think those people are actually human to begin with, which allows them to do something inho inhumane because they don't see them as human to begin with. And, and unfortunately, that reality is, is ever present throughout our human history, uh, not just the suffering of, of people of African descent, but just all over the world. If they don't see you as human, they can do inhumane things to you. It doesn't seem inhumane to them. So, so, so much of racism seems like an abstract concept you know, hypothetical, it's like, what is what does racism look like? And it manifests in so many different ways. Uh, and those different ways can be hard to put an image to it. But when it comes to the desecration of the black body, the, the outright disregard for black life, for you know, not mattering, there's no more powerful way to, to conceptualize that than to see the image of a lynching. So 
you, you have to do it very intentionally. I will definitely say that, especially if you're going to introduce this to, uh, to kids because you don't want them to just see it for the horror of seeing a human body look like that or that act happening, but understand the context behind how it happened and why it happened. That's the real horror <laughs> is the reasons that it was done and, and the, the rationales that were created to justify something so clearly to a child. It would say no one should do that. No one should go through that. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter uh, what their circumstances are. The first question would be why? After the initial horror of seeing something, like, why? And so it presents an opportunity to, to really answer that question. And, and part of what we're doing with the commission is to, is to really uh, disseminate that understanding as to here's why this happened and here's how it's manifesting today. That's the other part, too. We don't, we don't want people to see this in the vacuum of, you know, the 1800s to the early 1900s. That's just what we know of in terms of happening in the state of Maryland. But it's happened before that time, after that time, and it also looks differently today. So it's, it's, a, it's definitely a learning opportunity in a teachable moment um, and one that should be taken with the utmost respect and understanding of just what you're doing when you introduce uh, someone, especially when they're young, to the the worst of humanity because that's quite simply what it is the worst of humanity yeah and i thought it actually was introduced very effectively because the first time we see it we don't know that it's it's a reenactment and so that was kind of um, chilling um dr chavis what do you think how how was that um how was that handled do you think that was appropriate i think you know, the way that I think it's important that you made that major um, distinction where you said that the way it was presented within the film, we don't get access to the scaffolding that potentially takes place in terms of preparation and what the type of um, narrative change work or education was going on leading up to those events, right? But I do think that that, that is necessary, that there is some level of scaffolding in terms of providing context. I do agree with, um, you know, um, David, in terms of this, um, really in many ways, what we're witnessing, it's consistent when we look at racial terror lynchings historically, even to this day, the spectacle aspects of these this racial terror and how it is really, in many ways, saturated within media, um, the media of, of our time. Um, usually, you know, back in the day, it was um, newspapers. Now it's social media, right? And so there's this constant exposure to um, racial terror and anti-Black violence, specifically in the United States. Um, and we see that represented um, within on social media, as I mentioned. But I think for this reenactment, it, it makes the connection, right? Force a connection that in many ways, um, the youth, I know some of the youth that I've engaged and worked with specifically as a museum educator at um, the Lily Carol Jackson Civil Rights Museum, whenever you first walk into that museum, you see the lynching flag. Um, and right around the time of the Freddie Gray um, um, killing, um, the students um, would, uh, would make that connection. When we, when we would educate them about lynching, um, and they would, they would say, well, isn't this kind of still going on this way, right? And so in many ways, I think we, being concerned about the youth, I do think there, of course, should be an age limit, but I think being concerned about the youth, specifically in middle school, and high school students, I think it's a perfect opportunity to let them know to David's point that these things are not happening in a, in a vacuum. Um, and that, you know, we have to be, begin early in terms of making sure that um, people understand that there's a direct line um, between the anti, to, to, excuse me, from the anti-Black violence that we see with lynchings and racial terror to the same type of anti-Black violence that we see via social media, whether it's um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, et cetera. It's a direct line and the youth of today see that line if they're presented with the history in an authentic way. Um, Carl, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, one, of the, one of the cases they make, whoops, Carl, are you there? I am. Okay, because we can see what we can hear you, but that's okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, one of the cases that they made in, uh, in justifying um, the reenactment um, was that um, <clears throat> it advanced, somehow it advanced the cause. It, it, it uh, you know, they were saying whatever it, it takes. And I wondered it, what you feel about that. Do you think it was, um, did it advance the cause? Well, as I recall, there's actually two reenactments 
reenactments. One actually was reenactment with whites doing it. And then when no whites volunteered, they had blacks do it in whiteface. And it was pretty controversial from the whites perspective because they thought it actually uh, exacerbated racial tensions. I've happened to think that this is a discussion that we need to have. These are tough discussions. And it's not even a question of whether it's appropriate for young people. The question is how do we as a nation, as a people deal with this? Uh, David and Charles' description of what this horror was like is factual. But the fact of the matter is the vast majority of people in this country have no idea what lynching was. I had no idea how horrible it was. Uh, to see someone burned to death, to see someone have their genitals cut out, and this is horrible stuff. And yet it's a discussion that we have to have. I'm reminded when I um, visit the Holocaust, it's the first time I actually saw in my lifetime human beings made into soap. It, to me, it was incredible. But it also made me realize very quickly that uh, human beings can do some awful things to each other in the name of all kinds of things. And part of this history of our nation is, it's not by accident that black people were determined to be three-fifths of a man. And if you're three-fifths of a man, uh, you're less than human. And that's the way it was. Um, so I think, I think uh, we have to have a serious discussion on how best to present it. I think it's gotta be done in context. I think it's very, very easy uh, for people, particularly young people, to look at that and form a whole different opinion of how they should relate to other people. So I think it has to be done with some appreciation that this is a pretty horrible thing and that most people, many generations have gone through this trauma, have not had the opportunity to get the therapy that they need to be able to handle this. It's tough. So, you know, I have to tell you that I, um, and I realize my perspective on this is different, um, but well, I cringed when I saw the children, the young children that were brought there to see that. Um, I don't know, how do you, you know, what about you, David? So I didn't, I didn't cringe when I saw that. I'm always just mindful of the context by which they were brought to that event. So I don't know what the kids were told when they when they were brought to that. I, I don't know how much was disclosed. So that's the part that can be that can be problematic. I, I don't want to assume the worst of, of their parents or guardians or whoever brought them to the event. I will give them the benefit of the doubt that if you come to something that serious, at least you have some understanding of what happened. Now there may be people who are genuinely curious about what was going on. So I, I hope that the reenactors uh, took the opportunity to provide a full account of what happened and a full understanding of why it was necessary to recreate it. That's, to me, that's, that's always important, even with, uh, even with children. Uh, you don't want to discount their intelligence. You don't want to discount their wisdom. They, they understand aspects of the world, even at their young age. At a fun, and sometimes in the purest sense, which is what we adults need to be reminded of sometimes, the purest sense they can see that what was reenacted was wrong. And that's the opportunity for us adults to provide the context, yes, you're correct, that was wrong, and let me tell you why and, and show you the totality of this wrongness that has been perpetuated uh, where they live. And that's the other thing, that was where, that's their, their neighborhood, their background, their context from an environmental standpoint, they have to know, they, it's important to understand history to have a better awareness of what's going on now. So, you know, the reason I was a little bit late, uh, Will, was because I was on a, another meeting for the Trauma-Informed Care Task Force for Baltimore City. And part of what we were talking about in, in terms of, of decolonization or, or however that could look in this, in this system is you have to know the history. You have to know that what you're experiencing, what you're feeling in your heart and your soul, those aches in your body, all that stuff we kind of think is, is unique to us. No, that's your reaction in response to trauma. That doesn't come out of nowhere. You're not crazy. You know, that's, that's not something you made up. No, it's real. And let us show you the context that explains what you are feeling in this present time. So to me, I'm sure for those kids that, that, that went to that reenactment, they felt things they probably didn't feel before. 
And I hope that the adults, whether the reenactors, the historians, or even their, their parents or guardians uh, were responsible enough to acknowledge those feelings in their, chi in their children and to explain why they felt that way. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I think for me, as someone who, like, has, who studies racial terror lynchings, you know, I, I thought about when I saw the scene, I thought about the children who witnessed racial terror lynchings historically um, and that process. Um, and with, within my book, there's an image that I use uh, um, um, from the National Museum of African American History. It's a photograph of the actual rope, the rope that Matthew Williams was lynched um, um, with, as well as a note um, from an Afro-American newspaper reporter, um, Henderson, who was um, following the lynching of Matthew Williams, was there um, on the scene the following, the next day. And he remembers the children there, um, you know, hovering over the body of Williams. There's also a famous quote um, from um, Clarence Mitchell, his coverage of the George Armwood lynching. Um, I think the article is called No Roman Holiday, where he is literally there um, hours after the lynching and people are still crowding around Armwood's body. And there's a story of a, a um, young, a lady who's there, a white woman with her daughter, who is forcing her to watch the lynching. As um, Clarence Mitchell narrates, he, he sees the daughter, to David's point, naturally being fearful and disturbed by what she's witnessing, that human aspect of knowing that this is wrong. But then, the, then he narrates and talks about how the mother forces her, telling her to watch as the, uh, watch the Negro be barbecued, right? And, you know, when I see the, the reenactment and I see um, what we're seeing today, I think about those children of the past who um, would become in many ways the progenitors and carry on this legacy and that learning, um, this, this failed education, right? This display, this message crime that in many ways they were in, traumatized by as That's well. Why I think we have to recognize that we have an opportunity now to, to right these wrongs and show um, the youth um, that, you know, these, these are the things that happened historically, but your, your reaction for seeing this as wrong is something that is natural and needed. And it's really the first step in terms of this empathy to David's larger point earlier, having um, pointing to the shared humanity, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, the shared humanity. And if we're not careful, if we pay attention to newspapers, to the media, to various um, mechanisms, um, both people, black and white of all races will feed into this, this anti-black violence that will allow you to um, forget the humanity of an individual um, and highlight the, the human failures that we all have. And, and they're demonized before you know it and a knee is on their neck before you know it. Um, and their humanity has been um, has been stripped from them, right? So I'm gonna I'll, I'll keep going, Will, but you know, I just wanted to follow follow up on that. Yeah, so you know, one thing you know, you mentioned the children. Um, what we have now is the children of those children, right? That's who's that's who we're you know that's who's living in our state. Those are the people I think that we really kind of try need to try and um, reach out to. Yeah, and, and just really before we, I think it is important, I want to prioritize this, that we do have social workers and counselors involved in the curating and the these reenactments. I think we, we chalk it up to, you know, just getting it done and not really understanding, but I think there's enough um, resources now around providing historical trauma and support. Um, when we're curating and developing these things, I think that's something that I know the commission is prioritizing in our work. Um, part of the DOJ, um, with the DOJ funds, we'll be hiring um, social workers, a, a specific firm to be there supporting the communities during these hearings, um, which is important. And we have to make sure to center that, the well-being, and recognize this historical trauma and try not to re-traumatize as we um, tell the truth. Thank you. Um, Carl, I, wanted to, I want to bring in this um, uh, 
the the other main strand of the of the movie, which is the Lennon the Lennon Lacey um, story. And by the way, I'm going to I'm going to post something in the chat right now, which is an article I found from um, a television station in North Carolina that explained it was from earlier this year that that basically is an explanation of why the FBI chose not to um, pursue this as a as a homicide. It includes the entire FBI file, and so if anyone's interested, I think you'll. You'll find that interesting, but um, so so Carl, I wanted to um, ask you: How does that recent, very recent crime, um, potential lynching, how does that play into the work that you and the other commissioners are going to be doing now? This is not eighty-five years ago, right? right? This is 15, 20 years ago. So well, I, I'm just kind of curious as to how you see. The reason First, let me let me apologize, Will. For some reason, um, I'm not able to um, project, get a get my picture up. I'm not trying to hide. It just I'm having some mechanical difficulties here. We had an outage in Annapolis, and I think it did some. I had some problems with the with uh, the computer. Let me ask you a question this way, and then I would ask people who are online just take a moment and think about this for a moment because we all are affected by experiences that we have in life. And just very recently, I was in Ocean City and had to deal with the Ocean City police officer, chief of police, who asked me the question as to why young people were not obeying lawful orders. He wanted to know why. He said that his officers had told these young kids to get off the boardwalk and they didn't obey. And he said, well, why, 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 why didn't they obey? And I said to him, George Floyd. And he responded, George Floyd, what did George Floyd have to do with this? And I said it in this context, the two young men that got arrested, one was 17, the other was 18. That means they were born in 2003 and 2004. And during their formative years, growing up, just being not natural young teenagers growing up in America, they witnessed a young man named Tamar Rice at the age of 12 get killed by a police officer. They saw at the age of 16, a guy named McDonald, who was in Chicago, get shot numerous times. At 17, they watched a boy named Trevon Martin get murdered. At 18, they saw a man named Michael Brown and Ferguson die. At 19, if they were on the Maryland Eastern Shore, they saw another young black man named Antoine Black murdered. They saw a young man named Freddie Gray in Baltimore City, 25 die at the hands of police. At 26, they saw a woman named Brianna Taylor die. They then saw the most recent horrible, horrible death of a man named George Floyd, all done by police officers, all done by people who supposedly gave lawful orders. And you want to know why young people are responding to police the way they are? Well, put this in a historical context. We don't have to look at lynchings just in the terms of people being hung by a noose. But think of all the young people who every day experience racism, experience it in a real sense. Many of the lynchings you're aware of uh, started because of allegedly Black men uh, saying something or doing something to white women. And that leads to this incredible lynching. Well, this guy named uh, Bishop Jones told me this story. And this took place in 2021. 2021 to show you how there's some context to this. A young white girl, 17 years of age, was on the beach in her complete swimming suit, doing what young people do in Ocean City on the beach. A young black man, he too, dressed in his swimming trunks, went to greet this girl, who happened to be his schoolmate. They went to school together. And a police officer comes up to him and says to the young lady, is he harassing you? Is he doing anything to you? And the woman turns and responds, no, he's, he's my friend. The guy has his hand on his gun. The young black man is angry because, you know, this ain't a moment. This is a part of a history for him. And so he makes the mistake of saying to this police officer in no uncertain terms, get out of my face. And had it not been for this young white girl, 
who stepped between the police officer and her anger, her friend who's angry. We might have been reading about another young black man who got murdered. So I think we have to see what's going on today in a historical context. The same thing that led to some black men being lynched. Black men and black young men in particular, I think feel very, very angry when they are told in so many ways that if you say anything to a white girl, even if she's a schoolmate of yours, you could be not lynched, but shot, jailed. And they make the connection that is no different than it was 100 plus years ago. So that's where I see the connection. David, your, your thoughts? I mean, I really can't say any better than uh, the brother Carl just said it. Uh, again, I, I keep bringing up context because that helps us to better understand and appreciate how people are growing up and navigating this world. So the way that, that uh, Brother Carl just put it was, was beautiful. It, it really, really was. At this age, so throughout your formative years, as you grow up, you are seeing all these clear examples that your life does not matter. You're seeing all these clear examples that show the most genuine, honest, good-natured gesture coming from you is considered a threat. Can we acknowledge how much trauma that is building and, and, and just kind of perpetuating in perpetuity from a young age? And then you wonder why Black youth are so angry, are so anti-establishment against the system because they know the system wants to kill them. The system has no regard for their humanity. The system doesn't consider them human. So yeah, that's why they're, that's why they're down with the system. That's why I'm down with the system. Because I know it, it is not this system was not built for me. It was not designed for my health and my well being. Quite the contrary, the system was designed to use me in whatever capacity it could use me to its benefit. We 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 have to we we have to be mindful of that. And even within my privilege of being educated and having these opportunities, I can't divorce myself from that reality. I can't. And all it takes is one moment, one moment, one, you know, one bad day from a cop or, or one, you know, uh, moment where a, a white woman is just a little too uncomfortable with me being around. And that can end it all for me. The PhD won't make a difference. My association with two universities won't make a difference. Me being the chair of the Maryland Lynch and Truth and Reconciliation Commission won't make a difference. I will just be another black body gone because somebody else didn't acknowledge my humanity. So having to be in that mindset, I mean, James Baldwin had it right. Being black and conscious is a constant state of rage. So so don't let the, the eloquence that, that Charles and I speak with and Carl and I speak with fool you. We are enraged all the time. We are always pissed off because all, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see you smiling, Joe. Because <laughs> all we're trying to do fundamentally, and the reason why this work is so important, the work of Maryland Lynching Memorial Project, the work of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Charles's work at George Mason, the fundamental reason for all this is because we just want to live our lives. That's it. I want to live my life by my own choosing and to have my consequences be because of my choice and my decision, not somebody else's. Is that too much to ask? That's, that is the, the question I have for any policymaker, any lawmaker, any politician, any commissioner of police, whoever you care, whoever you care to put in front of me. That's ultimately where our conversation is going to go. Is it too much to ask for me to live my life without the constant fear of it being taken away from me because for whatever reason, you are afraid of me. You see me as the reason for your challenges. You see me as the personification of all that's wrong and evil in this world. When, every, when history will show you, in many cases, it's quite the contrary. I'm not the problem. You are. Thank you, David. You know, you're reminding me of um, what... Um... Brian Stevenson said in you know in the, in the film he talked about being 
black and alive in many parts of this country, right, is, is um, you, there's never a moment to feel safe. That's, and he, he's the one that actually said the phrase, you know, always in season. <clears throat> um, Charles, let me ask you this question in, in a slightly different way. And that is, how do you see, and you're familiar with the Lennon Lacey case because it's in your part of the uh, woods. You're, you know, you have family down there. How do you think, how do you see those events and the, and the, um, you know, the, the culture in which it, I know, I mean, the greater culture, right, of, in which it all took place and which it played out. How, how is that going to influence, you know, your work with the commission, do you think, or the work of the commission, not just your work? Well, yeah, thank you so much for that. Now, I am from North Carolina. My dad is actually was born and raised near um, Bladensboro and, and um, near Lumberton. Um, and so I'm familiar, very familiar with this community. I'm actually in North Carolina right now, Wallace, North Carolina, about an hour away from Bladensboro. Um, I'm in my wife's aunt's um, law office because this is the only place with stable Wi-Fi. That's how far in the boonies I am. So um, I said I had one more panel to do before we celebrate um, this weekend. So yeah, I mean, Will, your question um, is so important and timely. I think I just, in terms of looking at, you know, what this means for me as a historian, you know, one of the reasons why I work at a um, peace and conflict studies school is because I couldn't naturally not fit in many ways into a traditional history school department, right? Because in many ways as historians, we're trained to study the past and not um, what we call be, you know, um, anachronistic, right? And project our, um, what we learn onto, you know, um, current events. But for me as someone to, to David's point, um, who, you know, as a black man, I, I could not, you know, look at this research, what I'm learning about the legacy of racial violence in this history and not see the connections um, and the systemic anti-blackness that is really, um, you know, bold and visible throughout our, our, our country in, in every system, right, um, within our country. And someone who you know focuses on systems thinking, I think it's important for us to understand. In many ways, at this current moment in this country, the most difficult task um, that is um, before us is whether or not we're going to, as a nation, confront and embrace the truth of systemic racism, right? Because really, that's what it's all about. I mean, in many ways, it's easy for us to um, celebrate historical figures and those who witnessed and lived through racial terror like Mother um, Booker um, and others um, with the Tulsa anniversary. But, but it's easy to honor and venerate that history. But when did, do, you know, do we hear her cry for justice now? Um, and, and do we not just honor or venerate her as a historical figure or her testimony? Um, or are we really talking about policies um, and outcomes, because that's what this is all about, right? Um, we can all acknowledge that, of course, bad things happen, but what's more difficult to acknowledge is that these things are continuing to happen and they are the result of a fractured system to, to, that, to David's point, was never naturally designed um, for those um, who are oppressed, non-land-owning, um, you know, um, in many ways, I tell my students and in, in every speaking engagement, I try to let people know when I talk about systemic racism, you know, our nation was conceived in anti-Black, Blackness, racism, sexism, and we have to understand that. And so we talk about documents, we talk about founding documents, when we talk about our government structures. Yes, and when we talk about policing, these systems were designed in a way that naturally um, devalued and dehumanized those who did not fit into the foundational um, um, class of information. Right? And so I think it's, really, it's easy to talk about police and the police department, but I think it's less easy to talk about other ways of systemic, other manifestations of systemic racism within the education system, within the, um, um, the criminal industrial complex, right? What's really um, powerful about a lot of these cases, specifically with Bladensboro, but also we look at cases specifically on the Eastern shore, the continuation of the systemic attack um, that's represented through um, the outcomes in terms of poverty, um, COVID-19 support, vaccinations. If you look down each one of these specific areas, 
you'll see that the outcomes and their these um, that these communities are disproportionately affected, and that's always been the case. And that's why, for a lot of Black people, um, during COVID nineteen, seeing the death toll and all of these things impacting communities of color, it, it was a shock to the world. But this happens almost with every single health crisis in our country historically. These communities are always affected disproportionately, and it's the same thing in almost every single system. Right. And so, yes, to David's point, I'm always angry, but I try to balance it out um, <laughs> as much as I can and try to be hopeful and look to the windows where we can have a conversation um, about not only honoring these things historically in these episodes historically, but let's talk about how these things continue to persist and how we can begin to dismantle them. And the work of this commission and the work that Will is doing is the first step. But we can't just stop there with truth telling and laying it all out. Now we have to talk about what comes next. Um, and that's the more difficult conversation. But it's a conversation that we as a commission are going to make sure takes place. So um, thank you for that, Charles. You know, your comments actually made me think a little bit of what, you know, Barbara Smith, um, you know, her, her um, comparing um, white supremacy to uh, a default system it's like a it's like a, an operating system that it doesn't require individual bigotry to function um and I, I think that's important for people to keep in mind i think carl i want to ask you one of the um uh there you are it's good to see you um one of the i think one of the most um poignant um dichotomies that this you know film brought out was that you know when in is part of the lennon lacy story um where his family, his mother and his brother Pierre, um, you know, they are so um, upset, uh, uh, justifiably so that you know they're, they're convinced that there's a murderer on the loose, and um, and and yet you have the um, the editor of the paper who says, well, they don't have the manpower to investigate it. You know, no one's concerned. The sooner the sooner we get this behind, you know, behind us, the better. And uh, to me, that, you know, how do we bridge that gap? That's really what we're looking at, right? Um, between those who are, um, you know, who are, who, who see the problem and those who look away from it. And that, you know, I think that's something that we have to face in this state as well, right? The people who, as I said before, people who are on this call tonight, on this thing, we're good. It's the people who are, doing something else, right? So I wanted to ask you, how, how do you think we um, bridge that? You're, you're, you're uh, muted, Carl. Here we go. I actually think when President uh, Biden ran for president and said that the race was about the soul of the nation, he's right. I mean, we are at a point, not new. I mean, if you look at every generation, there's always been this issue of which way will America go? Um, and it's not just a problem, I think, of uh, white people not understanding where we are. We got African-Americans who have been uh, severely damaged by this system in lots of different ways. And they're things that I think that we have to begin to come to grips with. And one of them is getting people to see your pain can be difficult. I mean, the fact of the matter is for the vast majority of Americans and increasingly for upper middle income uh, black Americans, People go home to their fine homes, have their nice jobs, and out of sight is out of mind. Um, what Charles said about the pandemic and all the things that came out of it is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. It's not nothing new. Uh, because of technology, we're now able to see things that have already uh, has always existed. I'm so happy uh, that young people are emerging with a consciousness that are far different than a generation that I grew up in. There are people who are very, very conscious. They see what's going on. And when I say young people, I'm not just talking about African-Americans. For me to watch, as I saw all over the country, uh, white youth responding to Black Lives Matter. I'm in a part of a, the state in Anne Arundel County. We've got a very conservative portion of the county. There's a place called DL Maryland in Pasadena, which is historic in terms of its racism. And to see young white people um, marching and, and, and energized around the whole idea of Black Lives Matter give me some hope. I saw a black woman, we all saw this black woman. She was amazing. She spoke at the president's uh, inauguration. She delivered this wonderful poem 
it's a beautiful poem that she delivered. And people said, whoa, where, where did she come from? She's incredible. She's always been there. She hadn't been hiding anywhere. And uh, I think the more we get to expose people to uh, certain truths, the magnificent part of this film, from my perspective, is similar to a film I saw many, many years ago called Imitation of Life. If people took the time and looked at this film, they would walk away with certain perspectives. And one of the perspectives I think you walk away from, the woman who's frustrated that nobody's listening to her, that her son won't find justice, that particular lady reflects a lot of young people, excuse me, a lot of women today and men. You know, think of the people who've died that I mentioned earlier, who, you know, Trevon Martin's murderer walked away, scot free. Uh, there have been people who've been shot and killed by police officers, and the courts have found it as justifiable, homo justifiable homicide. Now, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you know, as I know, of a case 40 years ago, a black man named Leroy Perry coming down Ritchie Highway, coming home to a family, gets stopped by a police officer, asked to get his driver's license. He had a broken uh, trunk. He takes a screwdriver to unlock his trunk and he's shot dead by the police officer. And uh, they find it a justifiable shooting. Well, his daughter and his kids are now adults. They haven't forgotten that. And so I think uh, getting people to understand that this trauma is real and getting people who are affected by the trauma to understand that we need to do some things ourselves to address the trauma because a lot of this trauma, I think, is manifesting itself in ways that's not healthy for the individual, nor is it healthy for the community. And I'll end on this particular note, Will, and for people in Baltimore City, particularly people in Baltimore City, I want them to hear this. In 1968, when Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered, murdered, no question about it, you won't find nobody left in America who do not believe not only was he murdered, but the government was involved in that. I don't care what level, what money, where you are, most people who are African-American believe that. So in 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. is murdered. He has this incredible dream of America. His dream is that there will be this time in America when people will be judged not by the content, but not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And Dr. King raises such great hopes for the nation. And he's indeed the conscience of the nation. Fast forward, 2021, 2021. You go down to Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, and there's some squeezy kids, they call them squeezy boys, 15 and 16 and 14 and some younger. Can you imagine what King would be thinking today had he lived? That's where we are in America today. And the reason I wanted to make this point that all of us need to come to grips with this. It's not just whites, but African-Americans too, because, and this is the thing that will get me in trouble, but it's true. There are African-Americans who are riding down, seeing the same thing the whites are seeing, and their behavior is exactly the same. There are elected officials who are African-Americans in public office who should be raising the roof about the inequities that exist in the society, but they're too accepting of it. I come out of a generation that's far different um, the politicians I knew when I was growing up was people like Ron Dellums, who challenged the status quo, Hearn Mitchell, Shirley Chisholm. These were people who understood that this system needed to be changed, and they were willing to use all of the power they had. And so internally within the African American community, we need a serious discussion about what we collectively need to do to begin to address some of the systemic problems that's facing the nation. Malcolm X said, a man who gets knocked down unprovoked when he have two choices. If someone knocks you down with no cause or no reason. You either get up or you wait for the man who knocked you down to help you up. And his argument was too many of us are waiting for those who knocked us down to help us up. And we need to get up on our own two feet. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. One of the, one of the that um, Cheryl and Eiffel makes 
um, in the film was, you know, she talks about the culture of, of silence, the shroud of silence that has enveloped both communities, right? But blacks out of fear and whites out of shame and fear. Um, and she talked about, you know, that how communities need to come together and talk together about, you know, what they think would repair the harm. And so, you know, facing this history together. So I worry that there's not the willingness <clears throat> to come together, at least, you know, um, 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 in, in enough in the white community to, you know, to reach critical mass. Um, and I wondered from all of you, what, what you think, of, you know, what do we need to do? What can we do um, to change that? So in my work, uh, so my background is public health, and, and that's where I do a lot of my work is in public health. We are notorious for divorcing ourselves from our humanity in that space. The irony being that if you're talking about public health, it's inherently oriented or should be to the people. That's the whole point of public health is to improve the health and well-being of the people. However, we rarely listen or even ask for the stories of the people. And therefore, we wonder why nothing works or works well. Well, you don't have the context. What has worked for me in, in my career, and as, as Will said, I, I went to Johns Hopkins. <laughs> You know, they ain't too prone to have these kind of conversations around race and racism. Like, yeah, they're doing it now. I got Juneteenth off as a holiday, hooray, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but they have a long way to go, and they have their culpability for sure in Baltimore uh, when it comes to perpetuating these systems of oppression. I, What has helped me uh, a lot is to understand that if I had the privilege that a lot of people have, whether it's the privilege of race, the privilege of education, the privilege of socioeconomic status, well, there's a lot of things that I, I would avoid because this stuff is heavy. So I, I don't want to discount the heaviness of what you do, Carl, you do, Will, what you do, Charles, a lot of y'all in this room do, and what I do. It's heavy stuff. It's not meant for everybody. Some day, Carl, I'll tell you, I wish I had some days where I didn't have to do this work because it's heavy. Like I said, I just want to live my life. I only get one shot at this. <laughs> you know what I mean? I get one shot at this. So I want to live my life, enjoy my family, travel the world, all that good stuff. But I owe too much responsibility. I owe too much to people like you, like my like my godparents, the doctors Martin, Dr. Joanne Martin, Dr. Elba Martin. I owe too much to them for all that they taught me and all the opportunities they presented to me to not be in this fight. Again, I get it if you don't want to be. It's not for the weak of heart. But for me, my life's journey was made clear in so many ways but how to how to broach that subject how to even really get to the deep work of talking about race and racism because we can talk about it on surface level all the time i'll tell you i wish it was just as simple as somebody calling me the n-word i can deal with that real easy the other stuff a little bit harder so the way that i like to ground the conversation and the action is like this and i want you all to do this right now think about if you had the opportunity to reflect on your life before you transition, before you die, if you have that opportunity, because a lot of people don't have the chance to reflect before they transition. So imagine you have the time to truly think about your life. What will you be thinking about if you have those few moments before you transition? I guarantee you a lot of the BS that we deal with in life is not what we'll be thinking about if we have the chance to reflect on it before we go. I've been able to narrow it down to five things. These are the five questions that we'll ask ourselves if we get the chance before we transition. Number one, was I acknowledged? Number two, was I appreciated? Number three, was I respected? Number four, was I understood? And number five, and the most important one, was I loved? I guarantee you, every single one of you in this room, that's what's most important having the right answer, the satisfactory answer to those questions. Doesn't matter the color of your skin, doesn't matter how much money you got in the bank, doesn't matter how many letters you got behind your name, that's all we, what we want, right? What is stopping that? What is stopping us from achieving those things? When we, when we, when we truly think about that question and have that grounded, now we can look at all the ways that racism prevents us from achieving those things. 
sexism achieves, uh, presents, uh, prevents us from achieving those things, colonialism, toxic economies, all that kind of stuff we talk about all the time. Yeah, it's important to talk about it, but let's talk about why we need to talk about it and why we need to address it because fundamentally it prevents us from being happy. And at the end of the day, that's all we want. So I can go to any room. It can be the whitest room ever, and I've been in some pretty white rooms. But if I start with that grounding, we can talk about the difficult stuff because we all agree in the collective humanity. And for me, in the work that I do in this fight, that's all I need. You give me that inch, I'm going to take the rest of the mile. Thank you, David. Charles, I wonder, if, um, you know, from your perspective, is that um, – how do we make – white people willing to, to take that, um, you know, to have that conversation about thinking about how, how to repair the harm. Yeah, as a historian in a um, conflict resolution in school, that's oftentimes a question that I get. I think for me, um, I, like I tell my students, you have red lights, yellow lights, and green lights. Um, and we have to, you have to make a conscious decision when you're promoting anti-racism and promoting this work what area you're going to really thrive in, specifically in terms of, you know, trying to bring about resolution specifically around racial conflict, right? And so I, I say you either decide whether you're going to be a yellow light, deal with yellow lights or red lights. Dealing with red lights is not for the faint of heart, right? And, 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 and those are the individuals in many ways. And it really isn't what, to David's point, um, what we would necessarily think. It's taking on systems and institutions, Right. That's really where we deal with the more difficult, you know, red light situations and red lights uh, within the various spaces in our country. The yellow lights are really those who, I mean, in many ways, to David's um, point, are, um, you know, this blatant display of miseducation that is, um, that comes out in these various vit um, vitriolic um, epithets, right? Those are the easy um, yellow lights in many ways, because at the end of the day, it, it goes back to the shared humanity and the biggest issue that we have and the, the, the biggest problem with this myth of white supremacy is that it makes individuals um, believe that we have more in, um, against each other and more in, in terms of not in common than we do in common. And that was one of the reasons why I took um, Carl's larger point, one of the reasons why Dr. King, historically, a lot of historians believe he was attacked because he came after the American system of poverty and began to make connections between the poverty that was being seen in inner city black communities with the poverty that it was in white America and Appalachia, right? He, and, and when he began to do that work, then here comes, you know, now he has to be stopped in silence. I think we have to talk about that as well, the attack, um, uh, the ways in which whenever we have opportunity to come together, there's certain things that happen systemically um, and throughout our history that um, try to stifle and stop um, that um, forward moving progress that we have any of that momentum. And so, you know, that's kind of like how I would lay it out. But I do think I am indeed encouraged by this current generation that, um, you know, it, it was a really difficult um, leading up to um, um, COVID-19. But when I saw this interracial coalition of young people emerge, I think this is where I feel we have an opportunity. I, I, I like to tell my students, I've told a number of people that I feel like that in many ways was a death rattle of um, the beginning of a death rattle for you know us confronting white supremacy in our country. If we're able to really encapsulate that and galvanize that and continue extend on that movement where you had both blacks and whites, they are speaking out against the, these uh, injustices. If we can use that, and continue to build on that, then there is indeed hope. That I think this generation, as my cousin, uh, my, my nephew says, is not our grandparents' generation. Um, and um, I think political leaders have to recognize if there's any hope, um, specifically in terms of democratic leaders in the future, and of, even of the Democratic Party, you have, to find, you have to hear the voice of the youth and of those activists on the ground, because at the end of the day, they're playing for keeps and a lot of these things that we are, um, we're, we're, we've historically overlooked, there's just, um, they're not gonna tolerate it. And I'm not, I don't necessarily mean violence, but I think what's important is that the strategic efforts, the things in, with social media, with everything that we have, I think one of the amazing, most amazing examples that we saw 
um, was I remember that a couple of my friends on Facebook that I went to college with, they were talking about the power of TikTok. And I think it was actually when um, President Trump was attempting to, on the anniversary of Tulsa, he was trying to do this rally. Um, and basically kids went on TikTok and started registering for all of the um, seats. And so uh, I was like, you know, they, listen, they have skills and sets of, um, and tools that they're, um, um, you know, tools that they have that we never would think of having, right? And, I, and so I'm encouraged by that. Um, and so that's how I would answer it, Will. But um, thank you so much for that question. Sure. You know, one thing I think that's made, um, um, you know, made us successful in, to a certain extent in Maryland is, is the fact that um, there's so much support for this work all over the state. You know, the fact that we have coalitions in 14 or 15 counties, that lifts all of us, right? I think it makes it more important. It, it's got, it gets the attention of people. My concern that I have is that, you know, this reconciliation work, that's local, right? I mean, uh, and so, you know, it's, that's why it's really gonna be up to the people in each of these communities to make this work. Um, Carl, your thoughts on, you know, how, how, what, how do we give people the advantage uh, that they need in order to make this happen. And I just would also say to everyone, um, if you have any questions, please uh, get them in now because we're gonna we're running out of time, and I want to make sure that we answer them if we can. Thank you, Carl. Let me um, say two things. One, um, Charles is a historian, and so I guess when I remind the viewing audience that. We're seeing history repeat itself. See the great progress that Black people make and we now see the Supreme Court, the whole voting rights issue. If one just reads history and study history well, we see a lot of similarities to what's going on now. I happen to, I happen to believe that um, everybody has an obligation to do something. So I don't necessarily think everybody can be the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. I don't think that's necessary. I think the reality is, that everybody can do something. Everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something. I think we have to we have to say to people, you have a responsibility. I mean, a lot of people, you know, make well, do well. They don't they don't want to engage. But if you care about the future of this country, I think you better engage. See, I think people don't realize that democracy. We were two centuries and two centuries, a little more than two uh, centuries old. This experiment we call democracy, I mean, it's, it's, it, we're still in the process. We came very close to losing what we call democracy. I don't think people realize how close we came. And um, the federal government through the FBI and Homeland Security have been very clear. The greatest problem facing America the day they say domestically is white supremacy. That's a reality. And Will, you're absolutely right. Not all of us are on the same page. There are some people who fundamentally believe that America ought to be a white country. And they're working to do everything they can to make it a white country. Uh, the breaching of the US Capitol was a dress rehearsal for what's to come. So we have to prepare ourselves, I think, as a nation to stand up against bigotry. And it's not new. If you look at the history of America, there's always been these stages of bigotry. One of the things I learned from my mother who uh, died at the age of 104, and every time I get an opportunity to say something to an audience, I tell them what she told me. Because you have to have faith. If you don't believe in, have any optimistic view of the world, you might as well call it quits. One of the things my mother used to always say to people, and she'd get very angry. When people say, you know, nothing's changed in America. America, just like it always been, racist. And my mother said, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. I live, uh, my mother lived to be 104 years old. She said, don't tell me nothing's changed in America. Tell me not enough has changed in America, but don't tell me nothing's changed in America. My mother was born before women had the right to vote. My mother was born when there were people, uh, there was no, what we call social security. I always wondered how did black people survive? There was no social security in 1929 during the great depression. And Charles, she told me how they survived as a people. And so her idea was that this struggle is an ongoing struggle. 
We didn't get here overnight and we're not gonna solve the problem overnight. We have to begin to recognize the progress that we've made and the obligation that we all have to make it make even more progress. So one of the things I think that is very necessary is to hold people accountable, everyone accountable. I don't think we give people the right to say, well, I don't wanna be involved in this struggle. I, I've made this point over and over again, and there are people who don't particularly care to hear it, but I happen to know that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X did not give of their lives so that black politicians would be able to do what white politicians do, rob and steal. I wonder what that movement was about. He, they gave their lives to uplift humanity. And so we have to demand of our people, of everyone in leadership positions, that they see this, this, this bigger picture, what America can be. And there's no guarantee. We could lose this, what we call democracy, very, very quickly. And I guess as I get old, I become more retrospective and looking back at what was and then looking toward the future, what can be. And I've lived long enough and have seen change come quickly in our society. That's why I don't want people to leave being pessimistic. We've changed a lot in this country. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of change. Nelson, Mel Nelson Mandela didn't walk out of a prison into the presidency by accident. I tell people this all the time. I come from a generation where I know what young people can do. There's a woman who's 76 years old today. She would have been dead at 26 had it not been for black people and white people demanding that Angela Davis not go to the gas chamber. The war in Vietnam didn't stop because some politicians decided they wanted to stop the war. An organized community, anti-war activists helped stop the war in Vietnam. So I'm very, very optimistic that I think there's a fundamental belief in America that if we get people to have this vision that the vast majority of people, the vast majority of American people want a better world than we have today. It's hard though to have this discussion on race. How do you say to someone, what we're gonna do, um, David, during this process, if I know that you were part of a mob that hung my father, my grandfather, I know your people did that to my people. How do we have that discussion? How do we have a discussion about reconciliation and reparation in the same breath? And to have people come to appreciate it. And I'm of the belief that we can have that discussion. It's gonna be a tough discussion, but we can have it. And again, I think most Americans, most Americans understand what has happened in this country and want to see this country survive. And while none of us advocate violence, history tells us, Charles, you can't continue to oppress people and there not be something that happens from it. It, it just, it's the world as it really is. So, uh, well, in that long answer, I just wanna say to you again, I wanna thank you and many people on this, this particular Zoom People could do all kinds of things tonight, watching television, <laughs> having good dinner. Going. I'm just optimistic when I see these many people gather together who are willing to take their time, watch a movie, and hear this discussion among us. It leaves me re-energized. Thank you, Carl. And I have to say, um, the chance to be with three such wise um, leaders is uh, is encouraging, and it, and it does um, make one think that uh, that change is possible, and um, and and it's happening. Um, we we're just about out of time, but I wanted to give you all a chance to <clears throat> maybe just address one last question, and that would be, you know, what can what can the people who are on this call? What do you think we can do to help ensure the success of the commission? You know, as these public hearings are starting to roll out. Anyone, David? David, I'll let the, I'll let <laughs> I think the easiest thing that you all can do is tell the story. We are the story of 18 commissioners, a handful of staff representing state agencies, cultural institutions, and just the people of the state of Maryland. And we are charged 
and committed to uplifting the legacy of racial terror lynchings and making the connections with what oppression looks like now in this current context of a country that's doing the exact same in a very open, explicit way. And Carl, you talk about progress. That's the progress that I see. These aren't the conversations that just the intellectuals are having, you know, are, are around drinks and, you know, some snacks. No, no, no. We having this right out in the open. So like they say, tell the truth, shame the devil. We bear a witness right now. So what people saw last May with George Floyd was bearing witness. <laughs> bearing witness to what our ancestors have known for generations. So this, this truth has always existed. The only difference is now you see it in a way that's so clear you can't combat it. You can't justify it. You can't bring a rationale. You can only decide this is wrong. And you're right. There are more people, if we can go to all 350 million people in this country and ask them each one, do you believe in this system of racism? Most of the people are going to say no. It shouldn't be here. So to me, that is the leverage that we have as a commission. So like we've been talking about, the country and the world is looking at us. And there's things that we didn't share tonight that bring proof to that. We are setting precedent. We are making history. And the best way for people to get on board this train, tell the story. So come to our meetings. Uh, come to the, the healing sessions, because they will be sessions. They will be truth and healing sessions. We're not trying to call them hearings. This is not a legal proceeding. This is a moment and an opportunity for people to learn the truth and to heal. And once we do those two things, then we can start to talk about justice. So it begins with sharing this truth, the truth of this commission, the truth of this memorial project, and to allow people to hold space with us and without us. Because as Charles said, we got a finite amount of time. Yeah, we got extended, but that's still finite. So this work must continue with you all. We will do everything in our power and with our resources to give it as much of a model as a paradigm to work with. But our success and the success of other, and not to put all the pressure on everybody, but I'm doing it. The success of this movement for truth, healing, and reconciliation and justice in the United States of America rides on you. Because the United States of America is looking at Maryland. Because we were the first and we're still the only. And I guarantee you, people are going to hop on this train if they see the changes uh, that we anticipate on making. And we will make them. But I, I want everybody to get their, their love and their cut, being a part of this revolutionary process. So all I'm going to say is join us. Thank you so much, David. Anything to add, uh, Dr. Chavis? No, I, I, don't, I don't think I, I wanted to just say briefly, to Jake, like he said, join us. We're coming to town soon um, with our truth and healing session. And I think it's so important that we recognize that we're coming in town for a day um, for the process, but you're going to be in these communities much after these communities much after that, and long much longer after that. And so, um, you know, utilize this process to get the transformation and change that you would like to see take place within your specific community. And be on the lookout for various volunteer opportunities as well um, with the commission. That's all I'll say. I'll leave it to um, Commissioner Snowden. Well, one of the things I would hope that people do who've taken the time to watch the movie, I'm, I'm, I, I believe movies, um, they can have a tremendous impact on people. There's one scene in the movie that I just want to share for those who saw it. Reverend William Barber is leading a march and this woman who's lost her son. And he's talking about the need for this young man to get justice. And the mother is watching this audience, people just showing up in great numbers. And just for a moment, you see a little tear come to her eye. It's at that moment she recognizes the humanity of people. The audience is made up of a diverse group of people. People felt her pain. She knew that they understood 
why she felt so strongly to have her son, who we haven't talked a lot about, but if you recall, son was a good boy. 16, 17 years of age, had all these promises, hopes, dreams. The system said he committed suicide. The mother didn't believe it. There's a his brother who literally cries when he finds out that this suicide, this alleged suicide took place. For me, what made that movie so powerful is that people begin to see and feel her pain and they join with him. And although the FBI said there was no suicide, I mean, there was no homicide, I remember what Dr. King said so eloquently. Truth crushed to the earth will rise again. No lie can live forever. We've lived long enough to see men and women who are lynched in this country, who the generation that existed at the time of the lynching couldn't foresee the day when a governor would pardon people, pardon those individuals who were lynched. There are those people who would never think they'd see a day when a president of the United States or Joe Biden would acknowledge that there is racism in America and that we as a nation have to do it. So I would just simply say that we have to keep hoping, keep moving, keep the struggle alive. And just remember that we're gonna win because I believe truthfully that our cause is just and that we're winning every day. And we'll look back hopefully on this generation I end with this note. I've got a granddaughter. And um, one of my proudest moments was when I became a grandfather. And I thought when I became a grandfather, I'd be looking back at the good old days. I find myself looking toward the future. I'm always asking myself, what will life be like for her and her peers? And one day I heard her on the telephone talking in Spanish to a person. Her name is Asada. When she came out, I said, Asada, I didn't know you took up Spanish in school. When did you take Spanish as a second language? She said, I don't take Spanish as a second language. I said, but I heard you speaking in Spanish. She said, oh, no, no, no. I was talking to my girlfriend who is Latino. She's teaching me how to speak Spanish and I'm teaching her how to speak English. I thought that was a moment that I will never forget because I think the world will find people who speak different languages, come from different parts of the world, being able to see in America what's possible. And so I'm very, very optimistic for the future. And I would hope that people will continue to participate, to vote, to do the things that can make this country better and not bitter. So thank you, Will, for this opportunity to participate. Thank you all so much. I owe all of you. This was a spectacular evening and I can't thank you enough. I'm so moved by um, everything I've heard tonight. Um, before we do go, I did wanna give you a chance to um, note this book, is going to be available um, somewhat soon. David, uh, Charles, when is when is it going to be around? January. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll definitely have signing parties and uh, and whatnot. So here's the book. Um, we'll be public um, you know, publicizing it um, plenty. You can be sure. Um, so anyway, thank you all very much again. Um, next month we're going to be doing a, a really interesting film called Coded Bias. Um, which is about the and racism that's built into um, facial recognition and uh, artificial intelligence um, systems. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, so you're going to want to see it. It's on Netflix, so you, you can see it um, more easily. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you to um, David and Charles and, and Carl. Um, it's been a wonderful evening, and um, I, I look forward to seeing you all uh, again soon. Thank you, everybody.